Mr. Matt Hunter, Northeast Regional Manager for AWC. We are delighted that you are here today and trust that you will find something of value. Okay, I believe, um, let me see here. Marcy went over all of the other uh, housekeeping slides. So hopefully you're seeing a course description on your screen as we speak. Uh, fantastic. So uh, this was the course description that was sent out um, when, you know, when you signed up for this presentation. So I'm not gonna go over this uh, in too much detail, but basically we're gonna be introducing to you and talking to you today about two documents uh, that the AWC regulates and, and you know publishes standards and whatnot and, and does guidance to. And that is the co-conforming wood design document, which is available on the website for a download as well as the design for code acceptance number three, which deals with fire rated, fire resistance rated wood frame, wall and ceiling assembly. So we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, we have some learning objectives for you here. We're gonna kind of go over those criteria uh, in the code conforming wood design, how to size the building, look at uh, sources of fire resistance ratings in the building code, looks at types, uh, types and different details associated with fire rated assemblies, uh, and then discuss the code requirements, uh, specifically for the, the key uh, area of floor wall intersections in type three construction. And without too much further ado, we have our first polling question. This is kind of an icebreaker. Uh, Marcy should pop this up on your screen there, uh, feel free. Uh, for some reason, you're not listed on this, uh, on this uh, answer uh, key here. Uh, just check other, We're, all are welcome. Uh, we certainly don't mean to exclude anyone if we missed uh, your profession on here. But Marcy has a poll open. It'll be open for about 30 seconds. Please vote. Vote early, vote often, uh, and we'll roll right along with the program then. So we have 40% code officials, 39% engineers, 6% um, fire officials, 9% architect, and 6% other. Um, as like uh, Matt said, we are delighted that everyone is here and hope that you all find something of value. So um, we briefly talked about the code conforming wood design, which hopefully you're seeing on your screen. Uh, and this is a, a document that uh, the American Wood Council puts out. Um, and it was a collaboration between ICC uh, and AWC. And you can see the icons there on the front cover. Um, it, it's intended to serve as an index to the International Building Code provisions specifically for wood construction. Um, so it's, this is primarily, this is totally focused on the IBC, not the IRC. Uh, it doesn't address prescriptive one and two, two family construction, so nothing in the IRC. Uh, the best feature of this particular document is a series of tables, which we're going to get into further on into the presentation. Uh, but those tables do most of the heavy lifting uh, with determining allowable building size and height uh, of wood buildings. And it's really soundly based on uh, IBC chapter five. So we're gonna go over a formula calculation uh, sample problem. But basically the, the nice thing about this CCWD is that it, it, it short circuits those calculations. It gives you a tabular format to follow. Uh, so it does all the heavy lifting for you uh, and like your uh, I, high school algebra teacher mentioned you actually will not have to learn this uh, later on in life. So we'll jump into that in a little bit. So the first thing we wanna talk about um, in terms of building construction is the, the type and size of a building. Uh, those are solely dependent on the hazard association with use group. Uh, so you can see we have uh, the categories and use groups listed here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, you know, plan reviewers, uh, code officials, this is our, this is our bread and butter here. Uh, but the eight um, main use groups that are covered uh, under the CCWD are listed there. Uh, we can also use wood in other groups such as uh, utility and hazard, uh, but those occupancies are just beyond the scope of this particular facet uh, of the code conforming wood design document. So um, when we talk about uh, reference codes and standards uh, in the IBC, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about chapter 35. So uh, reference standards become part of the code uh, and chapter 35 has those lists of standards uh, that are referenced uh, in the IBC. Uh, it's gonna include the title of the standard and the agency writing that standard and which edition uh, of the standard is referenced by the code, typically uh, by, the, by the date, by the year. Okay, so other standards. Um, standards represent consensus on how materials, products, or assemblies are to be designed, manufactured, and tested uh, or installed. So it achieves the desired level of uh, performance. 
So there's several key standards relating to design of wood structures. Uh, for clarity on this particular slide, we, we're just depicting the NDS or the National Design Specifications. So the uh, NDS, uh, along with the other documents there listed in the text, the Wood Frame Construction Manual, um, the engineers called the Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic SpidWiz, uh, and um, there's a reference to span tables there. Those are all things that are uh, covered uh, by the standards which uh, AWC maintains. Specifically, the NDS or the National Design Specifications detail structural and fire design methods for the use of lumber, timber, prefabricated wood eye joists, structural composite lumber like your engineer wood products, wood structural panels, uh, cross laminated timber, or CLT, uh, and they allow the use of either allowable stress design, ASD, or load resistance factor design. Uh, all of these standards that are listed here, uh, you can find on the AW website and you can download copies of those at your leisure. So for code officials, you know, as code officials and plan reviewers, uh, chapter six uh, in the IBC should be one of your bread and butter chapters. Uh, chapter six of the IBC defines the different types of construction uh, with wood frame construction typically found in types three, four, and five. Uh, additionally, IBC has specific applications that permit the limited use of wood in types one and two or your non-combustible types of construction. Uh, and they can be found in 603. Uh, and a topic which is addressed in section five uh, of the code conforming wood design document. So type three construction uh, requires exterior walls to be of non-combustible or FRT and FRT stands for fire retardant treated wood and it has a minimum two hour fire resistance rating. Uh, so type three is broken into type three A and type three B. Uh, when you have type three A, you still have the two hour requirement for the exterior walls, but you have one hour fire resistance rating for all other building elements other than non-bearing walls or exterior walls. Uh, type three B still has the two hour exterior rating, but doesn't require any fire resistance ratings uh, from the, uh, other than the uh, criteria for exterior uh, load bearing walls. So uh, type five is also covered. In fact, uh, type three, four, and five are listed um, in tables under the co-conforming wood design. Uh, type five is similar uh, to type three, except uh, you know that you're allowed to use materials permitted by the code. The fire resistance criteria for the exterior walls are less, uh, and there's different provisions for non-bearing elements um, that might be part of the exterior wall enclosure. Uh, type five construction includes type 5A and type 5B. So you have uh, criteria for low bearing walls, floors, and roofs. Uh, and then type 5B is basically anything permitted by the code with no rating. In the picture here that we show on the slide, uh, this is a real common configuration, four over one, um, typically you know, multi, multi-family residential, um, type five construction above, probably type 5A with a three hour fire separation um, for the parking structure underneath. So this is commonly referred to as podium uh, or ped pedestal construction in the field. Uh, so way back when in the 2000, uh, when the IBC was first published, wood buildings were allowed to have areas and heights uh, commensurate with the largest buildings permitted for each construction type under at least one of the regional legacy codes. Um, moving forward, allowable building sizes have not changed all that much, uh, although the number of buildings that qualify for unlimited area under the special provisions of section 507 have expanded greatly. Uh, additionally, special allowances for various building features, such as sprinklers or the use of fire retardant treated wood uh, have been added into the code. So as a result, the size thresholds for wood structures uh, more often have been determined by structural considerations uh, rather than by code limitations. In other words, it has not often been feasible to have a, from a structural design standpoint to design bigger and taller uh, frame buildings since some traditional repetitive member framing methods are limited, <clears throat> pardon me, in spans and structural performance uh, compared to larger membered steel or other competing material uh, you know, components. So this is changing though. Um, in the 2015 uh, version of the IBC, we first uh, see the definition for cross-laminated timber or CLT. 
uh, and that was listed with other things, uh, other structural composite lumber and other engineered wood products that were first uh, identified and called out and defined in the code in the 2015. Uh, and it was also in 2018, we had some reorganization um, of those uh, uh, definitions that were originally in chapter six um, and incorporated them into chapter three. So general building heights and area allowances are given in chapter five of the IBC and limitations and factors are shown specifically in tables uh, 504.3, 504.4, and 506.2 for height, number of stories, and story area. Uh, and we're going to have some of those expert excerpts from the uh, code conforming wood design in the following slides. So here's uh, figure 14. If you're following along, if you downloaded a copy or got a hard copy of the code conforming wood design, uh, list the maximum height and area of a structure. Uh, to be dependent upon the occupancy classification and the presence or absence of an automatic sprinkler system. Uh, and that's right out of 504.3, 504.4, and 506.2. So you can have increases uh, depending upon the location, on the building location on the lot, <clears throat> or using some of the design options that are identified in Chapter 5. Uh, upper limits for the size of certain occupancies without sprinklers are located in chapter nine. So again, the fire resistance, um, fire protection issue. So this is just a continuation of that figure 14 taken from the code conforming wood design. Uh, you can show the, um, the number of height and stories, number of height and feet uh, above grade and provides the area factor that you would get uh, from the IBC as well. Uh, all correlated for you nicely in a sim uh, in a nice uh, compact uh, table with uh, the different occupancies li listed there on the left. So um, I'm going to go over these next few slides uh, briefly. Don't don't panic. We're not trying to sweep this uh, topic under the carpet. Uh, we really want to get into uh, the DCA three and start looking at those issues of uh, fire resistance and and uh, the floor wall intersections. Uh, but all these calculations are detailed very, very well uh, in the IBC. And again, uh, the beauty of the code conforming wood design is it takes the, the need for these calculations and plugging in the additional data from each um, subsequent uh, equation uh, into it into that tabular format. And we'll kind of, we'll look at an example of the tabular format, I, I believe for an institutional use uh, a little bit later on in the program. Uh, but equation here, the, the equation here, equation 5.1, establishes the maximum allowable floor area for a single occupancy building uh, with no more than one story above grade plane. Um, the, basically, the, the 5.1, equation 5.1 along with 5.2 uh, for the multi-story buildings versus the single story building uh, incorporates a non-sprinkler building factor, which is the NS you see on the screen there. Uh, and that establishes an area increase due to open frontages or open space perimeter around the building. Uh, an increase for sprinklers is also given, uh, but that, that's in, actually incorporated into the rows, uh, directly into the rows of table 506.2 uh, in, the I, in the IBC. So a pro, choosing the appropriate uh, A sub T from table 6.2 will, uh, will show you the um, the sprinkler increase uh, that's allowed for that building automatically so you don't have to do the calculation. So um, moving on to equation 5.2 is going to establish the maximum allowable floor area of a single occupancy building uh, with more than one story above grade plane uh, and simply includes the additional uh, factor S sub A and if you see that on the screen it's the actual number of stories above grade plane not to exceed three and we'll go over what happens if it, if it does exceed three. Uh, for buildings equipped with an automatic sprinkler system in accordance with uh, NFPA, uh, I'm sorry, section 903.3.1.2, uh, which is an NFPA 13R system. So uh, buildings uh, adjacent to open space uh, adjoining a public way with the exterior wall, uh, a minimum uh, of 20 feet from the lot line or the far edge of a public way for more than 25% of the building pre perimeter. Uh, get an increase in the allowable area, the floor area, by means of the, the term uh, I sub F. 
I'm glad that shows up that way because it kept on putting it as if on the previous slide. So uh, I'm tickled pink that that's shown correctly. Um, so they get, um, when you use those, uh, when you use uh, equations 5-1 and 5-2, you're going to use those uh, previous calculations to get these values uh, associated with these uh, ongoing equations. So when we look at the weighted average, you take uh, all the the, uh, the lengths of the W uh, and you add them up. So the weighted average calculation uh, establishes the W term uh, and is based upon the various open space dimensions uh, around the building. And we'll have an example of that here. So you can see um, this slide along with the, with the following slide illustrates how the weighted average calculation uh, associated with uh, equation 5-4 is done, and that's right out of 506.3.2. You can see the amount of open space we have uh, on each of the four sides of the building. Uh, and note for this particular calculation, you can use the entire width uh, of an adjacent public way, which is uh, in IBC terms is a street or alley. So the uh, continuing calculations for the weighted average uh, recall that the frontage widths uh, W uh, greater than 30 feet will only receive credit for a value of 30 feet. Even if you have more, you're only getting credit for 30. The one exception to that uh, for the limit of 30 feet is for a building that would otherwise qualify as an unlimited area building uh, in accordance with section 507. Uh, it but does not have the required 60 feet of fire separation uh, at all of the perimeter locations, so all four sides. For these particular structures, when they have at least 30 feet of separation all around, the value of W can be taken up to or increased to 60. Uh, and what this does is it equates to a 150% uh, floor area increase uh, per story associated with those type of structures. So here um, is a sample uh, that's taken directly from the CCWD. Depending upon if you downloaded a copy or if you have a hard copy, uh, it's going to be somewhere around uh, page 12. I think on the 2018, on the hard copy, it's on page 12. Uh, and this is going to um, show you or illustrate or demonstrate the allowable height and area calculations uh, using the actual IBC. So you can see we have our, our open space perimeter. We have our offset distances uh, to the property line and to the, um, the, the streets and the you know, open space around the perimeter of the building. Um, and we're going to um, determine the area limitation associated with this particular example. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we have identified all the lengths of our walls and we've identified all the lengths uh, of our, our frontage widths. So for W1, uh, in the example there on the screen, uh, the open space is less than 20 feet. So this side of the building in particular is not included uh, in the frontage calculations that are spelled out in 506.3.2. So the W2 width is uh, over the 25, uh, or over the minimum 20 foot. So we're okay there and for W uh, three, w, w sub three, W sub four, uh, you can use the uh, 30 foot uh, maximum to get the weighted average in accordance with 506.3.2. All right, so, and this is the continuation of the calculations. Again, the CCWD basically does away with all this uh, calculations. Um, so again, the weighted area calculations, uh, figure uh, I sub one, uh, sub F is shown with a value of zero here due to its width being less than 20 feet as shown on the preceding slide. And just continuing on, uh, the final solution showing the calculation of I sub F and plugging that back into the previous equation 5-2. Uh, and again, uh, I can't encourage you enough to go into the IBC uh, and look at these equations uh, and refer to the examples we show here in this particular presentation, uh, as well as uh, this, the examples that are uh, depicted in the code conforming wood design. It's as, a, as code officials, as plan reviewers, as design professionals, it's always good to know the math uh, and reasoning behind these code sections, uh, even though you can reference the code conforming wood design uh, to get you actually really pretty close uh, to the to the maximum values 
uh, that are permitted for the occupancy types and the different types of sprinklers uh, and the configurations that are going to be used in your building. So to get you really, really close, but you still need to know how to do the calculations. So no individual story uh, is permitted to exceed the allowable area as determined in the initial 5-2 equation, uh, that S uh, sub A value. Assuming it's a, 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 a smooth, you know, not a bump in, bump out rectangular building, uh, both individual story areas, uh, 21,600 square feet, as well as the total building area, 43,200 square feet, exceed those permitted for a non-sprinkler building. Okay, so um, the example assumed a non-sprinkler building, but it's worth noting that group A2, above the level of excess discharge, having a fire area exceeding 5,000 square feet, or having an occupant load of 100 or more um, occupants requires sprinklers uh, in section 903.2.1.2. And we're gonna talk about that uh, in the next section. So the actual areas of the first and second story are larger uh, than the allowed maximum per story for a non-sprinkler building. So what can you do? What can you do to solve this problem? Um, you could change the construction type. You could subdivide uh, those areas, those uh, area calculations with uh, appropriate firewalls. Uh, you could relocate the building on the on the on the uh, the site, uh, provide a um, NFPA sprinkler system, or reduce the overall size uh, of the building area. And if you see the asterisk there, there is a typo there that uh, ICC staff uh, have been notified on. I believe that's on uh, page 12 of the code conforming wood design. So hopefully that's changed in the online versions. Okay, so when a building gets equipped with an NFPA 13 uh, automatic sprinkler system, the allowable uh, floor area per story is increased uh, by 300% for a one-story building and 200% uh, for a multi-story building. And that's directly in accordance with uh, 506.2 in the IBC. So in addition to those area increases, section 504 also renders the increased height by 20 feet an additional story for most occupancies, not all. Uh, when they're sprinklered, the number of stories above grade plane, grade plane to be increased by one story, uh, and that is called out in tables 504.3 and 504.4. Um, so this is assuming that they're sprinklered with a full uh, NFPA 13 automatic sprinkler system. Uh, if you have a group R residential occupancy, a similar height increase, but no uh, allowable area increase is permitted um, if they're using NFPA 13 R system. Uh, the height um, is limited to a maximum of 60 feet and four stories uh, in 504.3 when you're using a 13R system. Uh, 13R is, is referred to as a life safety system that permits some spaces in the building to be unsprinklered. So like a closet space, concealed space, interstitial spaces versus an NFP 13 uh, compliant system is is sprinklered basically everywhere. Um, interstitial spaces, concealed spaces, dead end corridors, utility rooms, the like, stuff like that. And the volume basically goes from 0 0.05 um, gallons per square foot to I believe 0 0.1 gallons per square foot uh, when you go from a 13R to a NFPA 13 system. So uh, for those of you uh, that are on the 15, no worries. If, you, if your municipality or state is on the 18, uh, there are new restrictions and provisions uh, for buildings equipped with NFPA 13 R sprinkler systems. Uh, and those, if um, anyone wants to look, are referenced in section 903.3.1.2.3 uh, in the 2018 IBC. So when we look at what sprinklers do uh, for buildings, uh, one of the, the, the it's the foremost um, thing we can do to increase life safety in a building. Uh, this is well documented um, and the merits the consideration of designers for that reason alone. Uh, but their uh, advantage can also be economic in nature. Uh, the code offers considerable trade-offs for providing sprinklers, including these uh, listed here. You can see uh, flexibility and means of egress, uh, reduction in dwelling unit separations between individual rooms, uh, alternate to emergency escape openings, and alternate to certain fire and smoke dampener requirements for the um, interior finish, and et cetera, et cetera. So for that reason, sprinklers should always be considered uh, when looking at the overall costs for the product. 
So here is where we're gonna get into uh, one of the sample tables from the code conforming wood design. Uh, so this one is taken from the back of uh, CCWD. Um, and again, uh, these are the tables that they're gonna allow you to cut the line, so to speak, with those calculations. Um, it only requires the estimate of the open frontage of the building. Um, while paying close attention to the footnotes, and you can see uh, there are footnotes, um, several footnotes on this particular slide, uh, and those uh, depicted in the CCWD. So you wanna pay attention to those. They don't necessarily replace the formulas in chapter five. Uh, you should run them to get the exact area, but they're gonna get you very, very close uh, in terms of the actual square footage and spot on will get you with the allowable height um, for the for the structures and the configuration, um, occupancy type and sprinkler system and size. So there's a separate table uh, in the CCWD for each use group and sprinkler condition, and that's gonna be uh, unsprinkled or sprinklered. And if you're in the residential um, occupancy type, there's gonna be provisions for uh, NFPA 13R and even uh, NFPA 13D. So uh, the table show only the construction types that permit wood construction. Again, we're focusing on type three here, but the CCWD is going to list content for um, the typical wood or typical combustible types of construction, type three, type four, and type five. So um, the tables uh, have the appearance, uh, you know, they look repetitive, uh, but just pay clo att close attention. You can see we're looking at group uh, I-1, uh, with an NFPA 13R compliance system here. So when you're in the CCWD, just pay attention uh, to the tables to make sure you're in the right category. Typically, the, the less stringent uh, sprinkler systems will have lower uh, square footages as well. So if you, you think the number is low, just make sure you're looking at the heading, make sure you're in the right ballpark with the, uh, the occupancy type and sprinkler system configuration. So uh, we mentioned the footnotes uh, that were listed uh, on that uh, table for the I-1 uh, classification. Uh, you can see the footnotes help with the proper use of the table. They're gonna show you the assumptions uh, and also code restraints, uh, con constraints regarding increases for sprinklers in this particular case. Uh, this doesn't require you to calculate anything but the values reflect those constraints. So in this, um, in the, on the screen here, we have a footnote uh, e, uh, it may further limit your number of stories for buildings of three stories rather than one or two stories, uh, which are all in the same row of that particular table. So um, footnote E is flagged here uh, because the where three stories are indicated on the table, it warns you and sends you to the footnote. Uh, in most cases, the footnotes will not further restrict what is shown on the table, but you have to be uh, just pay attention and be careful uh, when looking at those different types and pay attention to the footnotes. So here is uh, a group I-1 uh, sample, and this is uh, taken directly from the code conforming wood design. Uh, I think it's uh, titled figure 17, uh, at least it's figure 17 in the 2018 uh, and 2015 hard copy editions that I have. It might, uh, can't, I can't tell you the page number exactly, but it's figure 17. So you can see the call-outs in the slide uh, that detail the open space uh, perimeter condition. Uh, which is going to dictate the amount of frontage increase uh, you're able to um, plug into the calculations uh, from the code. So, and here is a solution based upon um, the previous conditions that were spelled out uh, in that damp example with that um, I-1, condition one occupancy. So there's a footnote call out uh, in this table as well, and you have to reference them uh, during your plan review. They're not gonna be shown here for clarity and brevity during this portion of the presentation. Uh, it's just like the IC, IC, IBC. If you're taking a test or you're doing plan reviews, always, always, always pay attention to the footnotes. They're, they're critical for that, uh, for that reason. So there's an additional um, wealth of information contained within the Code Conforming Wood Design document. Uh, and we'd encourage you uh, to download a, a free copy of that. Uh, to assist you uh, as a plan reviewer or your plan department with uh, plan reviews um, for those previously mentioned types of construction three, four, and five. Uh, again, while we focused on examples for type three, uh, you can see that we're, we have uh, all the calls for three, four, and five uh, in the presentation. So 
solution is listed there. Whoops, sorry, jumping around. So um, now we're going to transition over um, to the design uh, for code acceptance uh, three uh, portion of the program. So we want you to be able to determine fire resistance uh, criteria uh, when we look at a typical wood framed uh, type three structure uh, as depicted in the IBC. Um, so hopefully if you're here for this webinar, you have an idea of uh, what the DCA three or design for code acceptance three is. Uh, or you'd like to learn more about it. So that's the, the whole premise of this presentation. So DCA3 is part of a series of publications uh, that uh, AWC publishes, again, designed for code acceptance. It can be accessed and downloaded for free on the AWC website. Uh, and I believe there is a very, very handy link uh, on your screen at this time. So you can download that uh, and follow along if you'd like. It was just recently updated, by the way, I'd like to point out. So. Before we get into um, the, uh, the DCA3 document, we want to talk about um, definitions. So when we talk about um, building safety and, and you know, exterior walls and firewalls and stuff like that, we first and foremost want to uh, identify the term and define the term fire resistance. Uh, I'm sure you know that the fire resistance or fire resistant rating is a good, uh, is an important concept uh, in dealing with codes and standards. Uh, and then in the ASTM uh, testing standards, um, they have a different de definition as defined as the ability of a material product or assembly to withstand fire or give fire, give protection for it for a period of time. Building codes provide minimum fire resistant rating requirements for certain building types, uh, certain types of building assemblies to slow the spread of fire uh, from moving from one building, uh, part of the building to another. Uh, and normally these minimum fire assistance ratings are specified in one hour increments, one, two, three, three hours. So the definition for fire resistance is key. Uh, wood frame construction, um, construction which the primary structural frame consists of repetitive wood members and assemblies. Um, and when we talk about the DCA3, uh, all of the assemblies we're looking at and showing you fire resistance for uh, are light frame, repetitive wood light frame assemblies. Um, fire retardant treated wood or FRTW as we're going to refer to it uh, throughout the remainder of the program uh, are wood products that when impregnated with chemicals by a pressure process or other means during manufacturer exhibit reduced surface building characteristics and resist the propagation uh, of fire. So there's um, some context um, for you from the uh, fire retardant side. Um, the, um, they refer to um, section 23, 2303.2 um, of the code. And they also have um, criteria for reducing flame spread. So they have a flame spread classification uh, of 25 or less, and that's per the ASTM standard E84. So uh, there are other requirements uh, for FRT uh, treated, FRTW treated lumber uh, within sections 2303.2, uh, such as determining necessary strength adjustments based upon testing and labeling. Uh, and it's critical to note that fire retardant treated wood does not have increased fire resistance as measured by fire resistance tests. It has reduced flame spread characteristics. So if you, if you need to limit or control um, flame spread uh, for a project you're working on, you can use fire retardant treated wood, but you're not getting any additional fire resistance. Um, and they're two separate things, and we're going to kind of hammer home uh, those issues uh, in a couple more slides. But the, there, there's no additional fire resistance uh, as compared to untreated wood when you're looking at an ASTM uh, E119 test. In other words, there's the ability for flames uh, to spread across its surface is reduced. Uh, it will burn at a similar rate, although the flame, the, the height of the flames will, will meet a certain criteria. But they basically perform very, very similar to uh, non-treated wood in terms of how they char and how they, how they burn. So DCA3 provides description, uh, descriptions of rated floor, ceiling, and wall assemblies. Uh, for the floor or ceiling assemblies, DCA, DCA3 provides data on both fire resistance uh, and sound, we're not going to focus on sound uh, for this presentation. We're specifically going to hone in on the fire resistance rating. Uh, 
uh, for wall assemblies. It provides fire resistance running from both symmetrical and asymmetrical walls. In other words, uh, is the wall rated from uh, fire exposure and fire resistance from the exterior and the interior? Uh, in certain instances, that's that's a yes. Uh, it, you know, asymmetrical only is needed to be protected from one side. Um, and the nice thing about DCA3 is it provides um, example details for common configuration uh, of exterior wall floor intersections associated with type three construction. So it's very, very useful for that particular application. So when we talk about um, fire resistance uh, in the building code, pardon me, I'll take a sip of water there. Uh, there's there's uh, methods for establishing uh, fire resistance criteria uh, in the code. So um, first, you know you you have to have the assembly tested in accordance with ASTM 119 or UL 263. Um, secondly, uh, we can have look at fire resistance rated designs uh, described in approved sources. Uh, this would include uh, AWC's uh, DCA3 document. Um, there, but there are many many different approved sources. Um, in terms of approved sources, UL Fire Resistance Directory, the Gypsum Association uh, Fire Resistance Manual, uh, among others. So the DCA3 and these other sources make the testing and research uh, more usable and accessible to the end user. Um, third point there, uh, prescriptive description, uh, prescriptive descriptions of assemblies uh, in the table, and that's in 7, uh, 721 of the IBC. Uh, the fourth point there, there are calculation methods uh, that can be uh, referenced in 722 uh, and as well as uh, the NDS, which we pre previously discussed uh, earlier in the presentation. So of the two primary calculation methods for wood, one of them is for one hour frame assemblies, which is called the component additive method or the CAM method. Uh, and if it's over that, it's, it's calculation. So the data uh, for many tests uh, was studied in conservative times were assigned to those elements uh, commonly associated with wood framed assemblies. Uh, you can use the tables there to build uh, or construct a one hour fire resistance rated assembly, uh, and it can be either a, a wall or floor. Uh, again, the second primary method is calculating the fire resistance of exposed timber beams, columns, or panelized elements, um, such as cross, CLT or cross laminated timber, um, floor, wall, floor, or roof sections. Uh, the principle is to design load bearing elements of greater dimensions that is required for the structural design load. So an element performs its function under fire conditions, even after it's lost significant cross section during a fire. And we'll have a couple, we have a, a few pictures showing you uh, samples of, of charred wood and how, you know, how wood typically uh, reacts um, in a fire. Uh, fifth, we're going to talk about engineering analysis uh, that utilizes comparisons of test data, typically from uh, ASTM E119. Uh, and the sixth point there, alternative methods and materials. So that's under 104.11 in the IBC. If, if your state doesn't adopt that or amends uh, chapter one, there are usually uh, provisions for accepting alternative means, alternative methods. Um, you know, they submit an ICCES or an IATMO or other accredited third-party accredited agency uh, report that shows that the material uh, performs to that equivalent uh, that's specified uh, in the code. And then last but not least, the fire resistance design certified uh, by an approved, approved source. So this gives the code official the ability to accept fire resistance designs uh, from qualified agencies, uh, similar to accepting published sources based upon um, accepting their source as a qualified source uh, to submit documentation. So that brings us to our test question. Mark. Share. And, and uh, DCA3 addresses which wood frame wall assemblies and the answer, the reveal? Uh, the reveal is 53% say all of the above and 37% say answers A and B. So, Tell us what the real answer is there, Matt. It, it's up. It's up on the screen there. Uh, when in doubt, all of the above. Okay, that's the that's the answer there. So when we look at uh, building code requirements uh, for fire resistance, um, there are a number of assemblies um, in the IBC that are going to be called out to be fire resistance uh, rated. Um, so we're we're talking about you know. Um, we're talking about fire resistance uh, associated with these um, different uh, components. Um, 
the important thing to remember is that each um, of these type of fire resistant uh, rated elements have their own code sections and their own rules, um, such as for termination, for example, uh, firewalls, right? Firewalls typically have to extend uh, through the floor and up to the ceiling or possibly through the ceiling up into the roof. And they're gonna have specific requirements for openings and penetra penetra penetration protections, easy for me to say, uh, continuity and the like. Uh, so we're gonna briefly uh, discuss uh, each one of these uh, defined terms here uh, in the presentation as we go along. So uh, for uh, walls and floors and roofs associated with different construction types, uh, for example, a type 5A building requires one hour fire resistant rated walls and floors. Uh, general provisions for building elements, the, the structure or the bones of the building, include some provisions for our other fire resistant uh, FRR animals. And we're calling those, all those terms in the previous slide are, are fire resistant uh, rated animals uh, in the previous list. So those are found in 704. So unique to this particular category of fire resistant element is that there are no requirements for the limitation or, or protections uh, of any openings or penetrations. Uh, you go to table 601 uh, to determine what elements need to be rated per each construction type. And we're gonna show you uh, a sample of that. So in this particular slide, uh, you can see we have type, th uh, type one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, we have uh, type three highlighted there for exterior walls. Um, so for example, for looking at uh, type 5A, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna need uh, a one hour uh, fire resistance rated exterior wall, as well as a uh, bearing walls uh, that are in the interior as well. And you can see the difference between the type A and the type B uh, values. So you should all be familiar with this table. Uh, again, you want to pay close attention to the footnotes. Uh, there, are opportunity, uh, there are opportunities in the table to use things like uh, heavy timber uh, for roof structures, among other things, in the different uh, types of construction uh, that are listed in the table. So exterior walls, um, there's um, all sorts of things required for exterior walls. They have unique sets of structural requirements uh, related to fire performance. Uh, there are provisions for structural stability uh, and how they are terminated, like as we talked about previously in parapets and the like. Um, second, the materials of the exterior wall are limited in different ways uh, than they are for interior elements uh, based upon the construction type you're dealing with. Um, the third point there, um, what determines the uh, ratings for the exterior walls? So either table 601, which we're going to, which we looked at and we're going to look, look at it again, uh, by identifying the construction type or table 602, which is based upon the fire separation distance. Uh, and that's the distance to the property line. Um, that's, a, that's a key issue. We're going to break that down uh, when we start looking at where the fire, uh, where the fire resistance is required, where is it coming from the exterior or just from the interior. Um, and basically when you're looking at table 601 and table 602, uh, if there's any conflict uh, with the specifications that are spelled out for your construction type, you take uh, the most restrictive uh, rating between 601 and 602. So um, the last issue there, um, required to be rated for exposure from both sides of the wall, when you have that reduced fire separation uh, distance. So, so what that equates to is that both sides of that wall uh, have to be designed uh, for the rated fire exposure. So um, symmetric fire resistance is required for all interior walls when they are required to be rated, but not for exterior walls unless they are within that 10 foot of the property line zone. So all other exterior walls are always required to be designed for fire exposure from the interior, right? The fires start in the interior of the building, they work their way out. Uh, so another way to, to think about that is that any exterior wall that is more than 10 feet from the property line is required to have its fire resistance uh, rating or fire resistance, uh, fire exposure resistance from the interior of the building only. So we're gonna look at these issues in a little bit more depth here uh, as we move along. Oh, so we had uh, three, four, and five. I think that might be a repeat slide. I apologize. I think we got a, a stray in the presentation. 
So let's look at these uh, samples of the ordin what they called ordinary types of construction. Uh, you can see uh, most of them have exterior uh, masonry walls, and most of them are associated with a downtown or a more urban environment. Uh, so way back when, uh, before the IBC, uh, in certain parts of the country, this was known uh, colloquially as uh, ordinary construction. So what are we referring to with ordinary construction? Uh, it, it, masonry exterior walls uh, and interior structures uh, typically of heavy timber uh, or uh, repetitive wood frame. Uh, so buildings like these uh, really were the prototypes, which would be described as type three and type four construction uh, in the first legacy code models, uh, such as the Uniform Building Code of ICBO, uh, the Boca National Building Code, on the standard building code or SBCCI. Um, so again, if you go back here, and it wasn't a repeat, this is why we have a two hour uh, exterior fire resistant rating. So I apologize, this wasn't a repeat slide. Wanted to jump back here and, and call this out. So even though we can use uh, fire retardant treated wood in exterior walls for type three construction as permitted in the building code, we don't get a break uh, from the fire resistance. So the fire resistance of a fire retardant treated wood wall would have to meet the same two hour criteria uh, as a masonry um, or non-combustible exterior wall. So then uh, let's look at the, that follow on table 602.3. You can see it has the proximity um, uh, of the fire separation distance to the property line. Uh, the closer you are, uh, the, the more fire resistance you are required to have. And again, we previously talked about it. If you're less than 10 feet, you need to design that exterior wall in type three, four and five construction to be fire resistant rated two hours from, uh, I'm sorry, not for type 5A, um, for two hours uh, on the exterior walls. So always reference table 601 uh, and reference table 602. Again, fire separation distance. So looking at um, type three construction, <clears throat> type three construction is a type of construction in which the exterior walls are of a non-combustible material and the interior building elements are of any material permitted by the code. Fire return and treated wood or FRTW, framing and sheathing complying with section 2303.2 shall be permitted with an exterior wall assemblies of a two hour rating or less. So the requirements for exterior walls became based upon fire separation distance uh, and other criteria were introduced to address conflagrations and exposure to other buildings. Fire retardant treated wood was introduced as an acceptable alternative for exterior walls in lieu of non-combustible, typically masonry construction. But again, that two hour fire resistance rating uh, was required to be maintained. So when we start looking at the criteria for type three uh, exterior walls, um, with the inclusion of fire retardant treated wood, um, there's, there's no reference to the uh, requirement uh, of, of, of use or application of fire retardant treated wood regarding the floor structure. Uh, so this slide, this is just a broken down uh, slide of the configurations that are depicted in the DC3 document, uh, with specifically focusing on materials. The red portions, um, the shaded red portions indicate uh, those that are typically associated with wall construction uh, and therefore are required to be fire retardant treated wood. The unshaded components indicate portions of the floor uh, and would not require fire retardant treated wood. However, as we'll see later in the program, um, the floor elements at the intersection of this framing uh, must achieve the same two hour fire resistance as required for the wall. Uh, and that's the most important takeaway here. So fire resistance would not be enhanced uh, by using fire retardant treated wood in the floor elements uh, in addition to the wall elements. If you review 602.3 in the IBC, fire retardant treated wood is only required to be used in the exterior wall. It's not uh, mandated that, that FRTW be used uh, in the floor framing uh, or for floor sheathing. So you can see <clears throat> we're on the next slide here. 
uh, we want to identify just for ease of, of use and simplicity on the, the slide presentation here. If you compare and contrast this to the documents or the details in DCA3, you'll see that there's just a lot more information uh, depicted in the um, in the eight and a half by eleven pages on the DCA3. But components of the exterior wall in Type 3 construction, we want to make sure that the wall the wall framing itself <clears throat> is FRTW treated. Uh, in this depiction here, the framing studs. The sheathing and on the follow-up slide, uh, the plates, um, the uh, double top plates, the, the top plates and bottom plates, and any blocking associated uh, in the plane of the wall uh, is required to be fire retardant treated wood. So anything that's uh, not depicted in red is not required uh, to be fire retardant treated wood. So um, note, note the absence uh, of shading that's depicted for the rim board within the exterior wall. So if we're if we're building a house, and you know myself being a former framing con contractor, I just want to walk you through this this uh, thought process. So when we're framing a house, the first thing we do as a carpenter crew is is get the uh, joist on top of the pressure treated sill plate that's on top of the masonry foundation. So we install our perimeter rim board, um, <clears throat> and to avoid overturning or toppling the joist. Uh, when we walk across them, we secure uh, those the ends of those joists uh, with a perimeter rim board. Okay, so once the perimeter rim board is uh, secured to the ends of the joists, our joists won't fall over. We can put our three quarter inch typical three quarter inch subfloor uh, on top of that uh, joist um, and uh, assembly and secure the floor sheathing to the rim board. Uh, and the joists. So the rim board uh, acts as part of the floor assembly or floor diaphragm. Uh, this this uh, concept and this science is well documented uh, in, opinion, uh, in opinions drafted by numerous structural engineers. Uh, it is The rim board is part of the many load paths uh, within the building envelope, uh, but so are all those joists and the floor sheathing. The rim board is a multi-purpose component associated with conventional light frame wood buildings. So we talk about those code requirements uh, for fire separation. Uh, if we have, um, regardless of the rating, uh, regardless of the reason, uh, it's pretty simple. If you're within 10 feet or 10 feet or less, uh, the exterior wall has to be rated from fire exposure uh, from both sides, not just the interior. So that's a, a critical thing, a critical takeaway to remember. Uh, to help you with that in determining uh, what your fire required fire resistance uh, may be. Um, the engineers here at AWC came up with this uh, fancy flow chart. So uh, is your fire resistance rating required from the exterior side? Uh, if their fire separation uh, distance is uh, less than um, or greater than 10 feet, I'm sorry, uh, you don't need exterior side fire resistance rating. If it's less than 10 feet, uh, then you have to construct your building to have fire resistance from the exterior side. Um, both paths uh, re require a mandate that you have the two hour fire resistance rating uh, from the inside. That's that's a constant, that's always. Uh, and then you can use the different configurations, which are case A, B, and C, if you're following along uh, in the DCA document. And we're gonna get uh, into those um, a little bit further here. So, uh, here's an example. Um, these details are, are basically slightly modified from what you're going to find in DCA3. Again, there's so much information, so much detailed information on the DCA3 uh, that we decided to kind of break these down and blow these details up a little bit. But you can see when we're looking um, at, at fire resistance uh, from the exterior, uh, we have uh, additional fire resistance, in this case, depicted by layers of gypsum that are associated um, fire retardant treated wood uh, components in the wall assembly. And in this case, uh, we're looking at um, additional um, wood to provide um, protection uh, to the associated structural components like the like the rim board. So in the image uh, on the, the left, we're wanting to uh, in, in install additional wood blocking uh, to uh, have it you know, burn and char away and still and still provide protection to the underlying wood from going from the exterior uh, exterior fire to the interior. Uh, and then when we slide transition over to the image on the right, uh, we're trying to protect the 
uh, key intersection of the uh, floor uh, floor ceiling wall assembly uh, from fire uh, from the interior. So we have our depiction there in green. That's our that's our piece of wood. That's our additional piece of wood cover that's going to provide uh, protection. Uh, as wood cover, so as wood chars, it, it protects uh, the underlying uh, surface from um, any negative effects associated by fire. So if you see green in one of the details here on the slideshow, it's it's uh, additional wood cover to protect the underlying, uh, the wood, uh, the wood that's underneath it. I believe that brings us up to our next polling question, not a test question, a polling question. It sure does. And share it. And, All right. have, and how do we do? We have 58% that said answers B and C only, and I can't see the answers anymore, so I'm not going to say that. That, um, that, is, that is correct. We wanted, uh, we wanted them, to, so the majority got it. So remember, with type 3 construction, we always have that um, two-hour fire resistance requirement rating uh, for the exterior wall. Uh, and because um, we're using wood in a traditional uh, non-combustible roll, all of that, um, those wall assemblies must be framed with fire retardant treated wood. So the answer is E, which is looking for B and C. So good job, the majority of people got it. So so we, we looked at uh, the different components, uh, those different fire resistant uh, animals as we call them. We talked about exterior walls. Uh, we're going to talk about firewalls next. So in terms of the the, the most detailed, the, the most uh, protection, um, firewalls um, are the are the, the the king of the king of the mountain in terms of these fire resistant animals. So the term firewall should be reserved for an actual firewall uh, construction in accordance with uh, IBC 706. Uh, firewalls are the most restrictive in terms of materials. Um, uh, in, in type three, uh, four, uh, and five, um, the termination requirements that are, that are, uh, that are followed, what their fire resistant rating is, uh, and what type of openings, you know, fire doors, what type of openings do you have? Windows, glass, fenestration, um, they can serve to separate a structure, uh, into two completely separate buildings, uh, in regard to allowable size. So in type five, a construction is very, very common with those large uh, pedestal or podium style buildings to have a two hour um, firewall uh, to separate those spaces um, into the, the allowable areas uh, permitted under the uh, IBC. So it's, it's critical that they function um, as designed and that they comply with the intent uh, of the code. Uh, moving on, and, and just in our, in our hierarchy of uh, fire resistance in the IBC, uh, we have fire barriers next. Uh, so there's, like I said, they're a little bit below uh, firewalls, uh, and they are pretty, pretty often called for uh, in the IBC. So in the last, um, the last bullet there on the slide, you can see that they're uh, required to serve shaft enclosures, exit ways, uh, exit access ways, uh, occupancy separations, hazmat control areas, uh, fire areas related to sprinkler requirements, uh, and other uh, miscellaneous uses. Uh, they also have unique termination uh, requirements. In the case of the walls, they must extend to the floor deck above in a multi-story uh, dwelling rather than terminate at or above the ceiling as a fire partition can. So they're, they're very specific, just not as specific and not as robust uh, as fire walls. So uh, last but not least, kind of low man on the totem pole here, you have fire partitions. So these are typically, uh, you typically see these between uh, dwelling units or tenant spaces, you know, corridor walls, stuff like that. Um, they're they're a supporting cast, but they're not. They don't do the heavy lifting that um, the firewalls uh, do, and they're the least uh, stringent for all the criteria that we're talking about in terms of fire resistance. Uh, horizontal assemblies. Uh, so these, uh, you know, now we're getting into floors. So a horizontal assembly is any floor assembly that is required to be rated for any particular reason. Openings and penetrations are always limited uh, or require uh, protection. Uh, and generally, the building element supporting horizontal assembly must have the same rating uh, as the horizontal assembly supported. So we looked at that uh, horizontal assembly for the pedestal uh, type drawing that four over one. Uh, that would be a uh, type five construction on top of a uh, enclosed or possibly open parking garage. 
with a tight uh, with a with a, um, a building type one one a three hour fire resistant uh, horizontal assembly separating that uh, that parking structure garage uh, from the residential occupancies above. We've got about half an hour left, so let's look at the um, integrity and continuity of those fire resistant rated assemblies. We talked a little bit about penetrations and, and opening protections associated with our different fire resistant uh, animals in the code, uh, but now we're going to kind of break these down. So the code has um, all these items that are listed in the code uh, have the same continuity to perform to that level of a, a, a fire resistance rating that's spelled out in the code. So the code is extensive requirements for penetration and opening protections uh, or restrictions in fire resistant rated wall and floor assemblies. Uh, there is also such an animal as a fire resistant joint system. Uh, fire resistant joint systems protect in, in, uh, intentional spaces between fire resistant rated assemblies. Uh, so here's the definition of joint above. So in expansion joints or other spaces due to dissimilar materials, fire resistant joints are not typically required in wood frame, uh, you know, typical platform construction uh, between uh, rated assemblies. Uh, the connections are tight, you know, platform studs, double top plates, joists on top of that. Um, so they do not uh, typically include spaces for movement. Um, you know, or expansion or contraction due to tolerances with other, uh, you know, competing materials. So we know what's required uh, for exterior bearing walls uh, in type three. Uh, it's to our fire resistant rating. Uh, and if we're using wood, uh, we have to use fire retardant treated wood. So you can see in the picture there, um, just an exterior detail of a platform, uh, platform framed building. So um, speaking about platform, here we are again. In platform construction, the floor assembly bears on the wall below. So the, um, the same thing, the same challenge occurs uh, with type three construction in terms of uh, the platform construction. So again, remember how we got here with the exterior wall requirements. We looked at those downtown buildings, those exterior uh, masonry buildings, you know, heavy timber on the inside or wood frames on the inside. So they had uh, two hour fire resistance ratings from those exterior, uh, those masonry, uh, two hour exterior rated walls uh, because how they were built and how close they were to other structures uh, in those downtown areas. So, but in the, with the modern codes and modern type three building uh, that has uh, enough uh, fire separation distance, it's difficult to assign a critical reason for that material restriction. In other words, why does that have to be non-combustible if the fire separation distance is, is adequate? Uh, so that's how fire retardant treated wood was eventually permitted uh, under type three, but it still has that two hour uh, fire resistance rating. Um, so I just want to kind of emphasize that we still have that the same two hour fire resistance rating, uh, even though the materials uh, have been, uh, all, have the material selection has been modified from non-combustible uh, to fire retardant treated wood. Um, so the, the nice thing about um, the, the DCA3 in, in this discussion is um, the fire resistance continuity at the intersection of floor and walls uh, in platform construction needs a practical solution uh, to, these, to these issues to ensure the fire resistance and integrity uh, of that intersection of the wall and, um, wall and uh, floor and, and um, ceiling uh, framing. So um, we want to um, get into um, the, the DCA3 guide uh, and look at uh, practical uh, fire resistance continuity at those key intersections. And we're going to focus on um, the interior, the, the configuration of an interior fire. We already detailed uh, if your fire separation distance is less than 10 feet, you need to have that symmetrical wall uh, assembly two hours from the outside, two hours from the inside. Uh, but we're going to primarily focus on those fires originating um, in the building. So um, first, all parts of the floor assembly should be considered part of the floor, uh, not the wall. Uh, at the same time, since the floor extends into the plane of the wall, it does support the wall intersection. So the code does require that the fire resistance uh, be provided for in this supporting construction, in other words, this platform style construction. We still need two hours 
of fire resistance at that intersection rather than um, one hour for a, like sort of for example a type 3a uh, building right you have a one hour um, uh, floor floor assembly which everyone accepts everyone it's, that's common uh, but how do we detail how do we ensure that the intersection of the you know wall ceiling floor assembly uh, meets the resistance criteria, uh, uh, fire resistance criteria for two hours. So if you look at it from that standpoint, uh, floor, separating the floors and walls, uh, and look at the fire resistance ratings for each, uh, it's a pretty conservative um, way to address the risk uh, associated with um, fires in type three construction. So um, in DCA three, the design for code acceptance three, uh, we have specifications and configurations on how uh, the rim boards to be protected, the amount of additional uh, uh, wood uh, that's used to protect uh, or, or shield uh, other structural members uh, in the floor wall intersection, the configuration of any, any mineral wool or, or fiberglass insulation uh, installed in the assembly, um, different layers or different uh, ratings or thicknesses of, uh, of gypsum, or gypsum wall board drywall. Uh, and values for non-fire retreated, fire retardant treated wood blocking. Uh, and those values, the, the calculations uh, for, for wood, uh, wood blocking, uh, pro, you know, protective wood blocking uh, can be found in technical report 10. So technical report 10 uh, gives you uh, design information beyond the NDS uh, in terms of calculating um, fire resistance of exposed wood members. Um, and it's very, very detailed, you can see that, but um, the technical report 10 is referenced in the NDS, which the NDS is then referenced uh, in the IBC. So for your calculations of uh, fire resistance for exposed wood members, uh, the thing to remember is wood typically chars or burns at approximately 1.5 uh, inches per hour, a little more, a little less, depending upon the actual configuration uh, of the fire. Uh, so typically, a, a two by uh, a, a nominal you know two by piece of lumber uh, burned from one side to the other would typically have about an hour of fire resistance. So again, uh, remembering that the fire retardant treatment doesn't increase the fire resistance of wood member; it delays ignition in some cases uh, and controls flame spread. So there, you need to remember that that value 1.5 inches uh, of of uh, char or 1.5 inches uh, of hour per uh, as wood burns. So here's a picture of a, of a CLT product, you know, a solid uh, solid sawn manufactured or structural composite lumber engineered wood product uh, that's known as cross laminated timber or CLT. Uh, and this particular piece was removed from the ceiling, uh, the exposed ceiling uh, at the ATF lab. You can see the heavy char uh, that was formed on the uh, on the bottom lamination, uh, but again, it's solid wood. It's in this particular instance, it's held together uh, with adhesives. If we're using uh, wood blocking, uh, it might be nailed to to a rim board, or uh, additional blocking might be installed in the in the floor wall ceiling assembly. Uh, not necessarily uh, held there with adhesive, but it's going to burn at that very predictable, very easily calculated rate of 1.5 inches per hour uh, and here's a, a different view uh, of that piece of wood uh, that was uh, burned you can see uh, the char has worked its way almost through the the um, bottom lamination there but you can see the the second layer above it is is protected from the negative effects of uh, heat and flame so we just want to focus on this uh, concept of solid wood blocking um, insulating and protecting uh, the underlying wood uh, structure uh, from the negative effects of heat and fire. So um, these uh, are just blown up and kind of more detailed broken down versions of the um, details that are depicted in DCA3. If you look in DCA3, you'll see all the individual cases, case, um, case A, case B, and case C. Uh, depicted underneath where the little flame icon is uh, on the on the pictures and the slides. There's just too much information on those individual DCA3 pages to uh, depict 
uh, on a PowerPoint here. So we kind of broke them down uh, for ease of use and we focused on uh, looking at each case individually with each configuration uh, of the slide uh, depicted on the same uh, on the same PowerPoint slide, so you can kind of get the the concept uh, of what we're trying to do. So again, we're, anything depicted with uh, red uh, is fire retardant treated wood. In the case we're dealing with fire resistance, again from the interior, uh, the insulation component is also going to make some sort of contribution to the fire resistant rating of the wall. So you can see the insulation is typically depicted there in pink. Um, and again, we're going to look at all those different configurations, uh, case A, case B, and case C. Um, per the exposed wood member burning characteristic equations in technical report 10 that are referenced in the NDS uh, that show up in the IBC is where we're going to get our fire resistance rating um, uh, for these particular details. So the three different alternatives. Uh, for a configuration of a rim board or blocking configurations uh, where the exterior wall is rated from the inside only, hence the flames on the inside. Um, the one from figure 1A on the left uh, uses an exterior rim board and blocking. Uh, the one in the middle from figure 1B uses two rim boards. Uh, and the one on the right from figure 1C uses a rim board that is sized to provide additional wood cover for the required fire resistance. Uh, note that in each alternative, the rim board is designed to carry the full weight of the wall load. Uh, additionally, at least one, eighth, one and one eighth of an inch of additional wood protection in the form of blocking a second rim board or as part of a larger section rim board uh, on the one on the far right must be provided. Uh, also, each of these alternatives uh, depicted in these figures require two layers of 5 8 type X gypsum wall board. Uh, on the ceiling. So you can see just a different configuration of how the the, frame, the framing details are going to provide the necessary protection in the case of uh, uh, wood blocking or additional rim boards to protect the structural load bearing characteristics uh, of the exterior rim board. The one on the far right is just a, a, a very, very large piece of wood, uh, again, backed up with the minimum required thickness of additional wood cover to protect uh, that rim board configuration. So that's um, figures 1A, 1B, and 1C uh, with the applicable KC from taken from the DCA3. Um, so again, you have uh, the same detail, but with the different, um, the different alternatives. And this one's uh, case B. So you can see um, on the bottom of the slide there, the ceiling membrane is two layers of uh, gypsum, uh, but it's half inch instead of uh, five eighths like the previous slide. Um, and the, um, the difference here is that the ceiling membrane, uh, again, is half inch instead of five eighths. And the, the additional wood thickness of the blocking second rim or extra rim thickness is now up from the minimum of one and one eighth on the previous slide. Uh, up to one and three quarters of an inch thick. So again, we have less uh, fire resistance in terms of the uh, floor ceiling assembly with the half inch type X gypsum wall board than we did previously with the two layers of five eighths type X. So we need to increase the robustness of our uh, additional wood cover uh, on our structural rim boards or double rim boards uh, from one and one eighth to one and three quarter. So going to the next one, this is case C. Uh, and this is, this is uh, really important here when we start looking at um, the floor ceiling assembly uh, and the configuration of resilient channels, um, gypsum wall board uh, and uh, non-combustible or, or rock mineral wool insulation. So uh, case C, we have um, the, the ceiling, ins uh, ceiling installation uh, and insulation. We have one layer of 5 8 type X gypsum wall board that's secured to resilient channels. And it's difficult to see here in terms of visual clarity, uh, but that's why we, we call it out here in the text uh, on the slide in bold and underlined. That rock mineral wool insulation uh, is a critical uh, component uh, in this particular uh, protection for the ceiling because we're down to uh, one layer of 5 8 type X. We need to get some additional fire resistance 
uh, to that key, uh, the rim board um, location. So we're using a 2.5 pounds per cubic uh, foot mineral, rock mineral insulation. And we wanted to make it clear that there were resilient channels uh, on the detail here that we're holding, um, that we're securing the gypsum to the, um, in this case, you know, uh, eye joist or, or wood, uh, wood framing underneath. Uh, but in, in reality, if you refer to the picture at the beginning of the presentation, the insulation bats are indeed resting on uh, the, the top surface of the resilient channels. In fact, the resilient channels are essentially holding them uh, from falling down in, in between those, uh, those uh, wood framing spaces. So um, the, we're just trying to depict here that the ends of the rock mineral wool insulation is sticking up above uh, the you know bottom flange of an bottom flange of an eye joist or, or bottom you know sticking up the sides of a solid sawn lumber, but it is it is it is indeed resting on uh, the resin channels, which is then uh, secured to the drywall below. Again, one layer of five eighths type X versus two layers of half inch type X or two layers of five eighths going from case A, case B, uh, and case C. So um, we have a detail in DCA3 uh, for a type 3B uh, exterior wall detail, and this is figure two. Um, so uh, in table one, in table 601, floors in type 3B construction are not required to be rated. So when we look at this particular detail, uh, we do not assume any uh, fire resistance rating protection uh, provided by the ceiling. There's no contribution from the ceiling components there. So if we look at the methodology uh, for fire exposure uh, from the uh, interior side, uh, one layer of um, two and five eighths uh, thick uh, wood blocking or two layers of blocking with a total thickness of three inches provides two hours of fire protection to the rim board based upon those NDS calculations for char depth. So we need to basically increase the thickness uh, of our blocking of, or, our, um, or of our rim board uh, to take into account we're not going to get any fire resistance uh, from, the, uh, from the floor framing assembly. Uh, it's unrated. So we don't have a one hour uh, fire resistant uh, floor assembly intersecting with our two hour rated exterior wall, we need to account for all the fire resistance um, and uh, protection from the thickness of the blocking associated with our uh, rim board or double rim board. And in this case, um, this particular configuration, we're depicting eye joists. So the, uh, the second text box there, untreated wood or other approved material to fill the gap, that would be the, the gap created between the flanges and the web. Of uh, the eye joist that would not be a squash block. That's a different structural issue. Uh, in this case, there would be a, a sacrificial, or there would be an additional uh, piece of wood blocking in there to choke off that gap uh, to prevent the fire and smoke and flame from getting uh, to the rim board. So we looked at the um, the key floor wall uh, intersections um, in the DC3. Now we're going to start looking at uh, the fire resistant uh, rated assemblies. Um, for walls and floors on their own. Uh, so the, the sta these standard uh, wall and floor ceiling assemblies uh, have been attested, uh, have been tested up here, here so they can be specified where rated assemblies are required. So <clears throat> the fire resistance ratings given in DCA3, <clears throat> pardon me, take a drink here. Um, the ones listed in DCA3, are in compliance with at least three of the code established methods. Um, one, they were all tested in accordance with ASTM E119. Uh, the DCA3 is considered to be an approved source uh, for fire resistance uh, and duplicate or very similar, uh, similar assemblies are prescribed uh, in that section 721 uh, in the IBC. So as you can see, the fire resistance ratings, the assemblies called out in DCA3, are justifiable through multiple avenues allowed under the IBC. So um, we're going to look at um, this, the image on, this, on the slide to your right that's depicted from Table 1 uh, right out of the DCA3. And table 1 provides descriptions of one-hour fire-resistant rated assemblies. It includes a mixture of some uh, symmetrical assemblies and some asymmetrical assemblies. 
again, when we talk about symmetrical, both sides, uh, asymmetrical uh, from, um, from one side. Uh, and if we look at table uh, two, which is in the lower portion of the, the, the screen there in the, in the image, uh, we were calling out uh, fire resistant, two hour fire resistant rated wall assemblies. So this is a symmetrical wall assembly rated from either side. Um, both of these tables, uh, there are embedded links to take the reader to detailed descriptions of each uh, individual assembly. So if you click on those links uh, when you when you have a, the document on your PC or laptop, it'll take you to a, a detailed description. Just want to point out um, in terms of these um, rated assemblies, uh, most of them, uh, four of them, in fact, are rated to 100% design load. Uh, I believe there's one that's rated to 78% uh, uh, of the of the uh, rated design load. And again, uh, most all of these were tested in an ASTM E119 um, fire test. So we have a detail here. Uh, WS4-1.1, uh, uh, which is a symmetrical one-hour wall assembly. Uh, and this is going to be rated from both sides. You can see there in the in the graphic, we have um, gypsum, 5 8 type gypsum on both sides, uh, specific screws secured to the studs, and a specific um, configuration of insulation, one depicted with fiberglass and two uh, with rock mineral wool, and one without insulation altogether. And just a couple more slides here. We'll go through these quickly. Um, the asymmetrical wall assemblies, you know, you might have um, exterior rated uh, sheathing, wood structural panel sheathing on one side, uh, no requirements for fire resistance from the exterior. So you're gonna have fire resistance from the interior side. Um, and the, uh, the figure there, WS4-1.2, uh, depicts uh, the configuration which, which that assembly might be used. Um, there's uh, call outs for assemblies with two by four studs at 16 inches on center, uh, two with two by six studs at 16 inches on center, and one with uh, two by six studs on 24 inches on center. And there's call outs for the different uh, insulation uh, uh, components there as well. And again, uh, those four are rated to 100% design load. Uh, and one, I think, which was tested quite some time ago is uh, rated to 78% of the design load. So uh, symmetrical two hour wall assembly. So this would be your kind of your bread and butter for a type three um, with a fire separation distance of less than uh, two feet. Uh, so you have uh, layers of, of gypsum uh, protection on the outside. Uh, we're not depicting any sheathing here for clarity, uh, but this is calling out, um, you know, this particular assembly is, is not depicting that, but so it probably wouldn't be exterior wall, my mistake. Uh, but it is a symmetrical uh, wall assembly, uh, which means it can take two hour fire resistance uh, ratings from both sides. And again, it's uh, rated to 100% design load. So uh, there's another, just a, a blow up detail. We're not showing the screws on this for clarity, but you can just see uh, we have our fire retardant treated wood stud there. We have a, a rock mineral wool uh, insulation criteria. 100% design load, and we have two layers of 5 8 gypsum uh, on each side. So we have just a slew of different details uh, to help you or as a specifier or designer to ensure that you need, uh, that you get the, the required fire resistance you need uh, from those types of assemblies. We've got about five minutes left, so I'm gonna kind of zoom through these. Uh, if you look at the DCA3, you can look at all those uh, tables. You can see those floor, different different wall assemblies, different floor ceiling assemblies, uh, how they were tested. Uh, are they single or double layer assemblies? Um, you know, are they attached directly to the structural framing, the, the, the ceiling joist, or are they attached with steel furring? Those different uh, depictions are all spelled out there uh, in the individual tables uh, in the DCA3 document. So there are some single layer uh, floor, uh, one hour floor ceiling assemblies. You can see uh, in the depiction there, we're looking at eye joists in this configuration. Um, some of them have uh, 5 8 type C, which has a uh, type C wallboard, which has apparently more vermiculite in it, so it doesn't open up as much. Uh, and there's one with half inch type C gypsum wallboard as well. Uh, 24 inches uh, on center framing or less. Uh, and we are talking about resilient uh, channels or hat channels 
and the use of rock mineral wool uh, insulation for those tested assemblies. Here's one that has a double layer. Again, um, pretty similar, except just additional layers of gypsum and selenium resilient channels. Um, there's one that's um, depicted with fiberglass insulation here, uh, and the other ones have no insulation uh, in that particular configuration uh, for uh, double layer assemblies. And we get into two hour uh, floor ceiling assemblies. So you're gonna see multiple layers of gypsum. You're gonna see those resilient channels. Um, you're gonna have uh, criteria on maximum spacing uh, for eye joist framing uh, and minimum required thicknesses uh, for uh, the thickness of the fiberglass insulation. So you need to follow these specifications. You can see uh, on the detail there on the, on the picture, very, very detailed, and just, you know, from soup to nuts, what exactly what you need to do uh, to uh, construct that in accordance uh, with the fire resistant rated uh, design of the assembly. And there's some just different options for you here. Um, you can have uh, concrete uh, or lightweight um, uh, floor toppings associated with these. And again, these would probably get into more uh, of the a sound issue as well, uh, in addition to, to fire resistance. Uh, and there are some uh, configurations and options for eye joist framing. Again, uh, kind of maxing out at the 24 inches on center. Um, and you can have any uh, code permitted floor covering. Um, insulation thickness is greater than or equal to the specified minimum. So as long as you meet the minimum, you can have more. If you have an energy issue, if you have a sound attenuation issue, you can certainly use more. Uh, you're just adding uh, more uh, resistance by putting more insulation in that particular assembly as long as you meet the prescribed the minimums. Um, these options apply to all DCA floor ceiling assemblies and um, you, your fire resistant ratings would still apply uh, with all the different variations and configurations that are spelled out in DCA3. So I believe we're getting right up to the half hour here. Uh, one more polling question for you, um, and then we'll have hey, some Matt, housekeeping at the end. Lori, we're going to go ahead and skip this poll since we're close Fair to enough. the end of the half hour. So if you want to just go through the answer with folks. Yep. In type three construction, um, 602.3 requires which of the following wood members to be fire retardant treated wood, framing and sheathing in the exterior walls, answer B. That's what we have for you today. Um, I've not been able to track the uh, chat box. Have we had any questions come in? So we had several questions kind of along the same line. When it's, we were talking about type three projects uh, where there, I believe there is a requirement for exterior bearing walls in type three construction to be uh, fire retardant treated wood or, or non-combustible, is that correct? Correct. So can you talk a little bit about it, um, the, the requirements, uh, if you have an exterior wall that is non-bearing, for example, would that still be required to be fire retardant treated wood uh, or, or would you be able to use a non-FRTW assembly in that case? And have you heard think, of AHJs? Yeah, I, yeah, uh, there are certain, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, have you heard of AHJ, AHJ's kind of interpreting that in different ways? So the, the question, just so I'm clear, is that if you have an exterior uh, wall assembly uh, that's not a load-bearing assembly, mm -hmm. but it's still part of the exterior wall, right? Uh, I believe the code uh, criteria on that would be that you, you know, regardless if it's load-bearing or not, if it's part of the exterior wall, uh, under type three construction, it would it would more than likely be required to be fire retardant treated wood. In other words, it would it would have mm -hmm. to be constructed the same. Now, if it's if it's outside of the the, the fire separation distance, um, you know, there there you wouldn't have to protect it from both sides. But if you if you just because it's it's you know it's a facade or something it's not a load bearing wall assembly if it's still part of the exterior wall associated with type three construction it's going to need to be constructed with the fire retardant treated wood components um, as prescribed in the IBC and NDCA three. 
Mm -hmm. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I think um, <laughs> I think one of my engineers chimed in uh, and said uh, that was correct. So yeah, sec section six of two point three is pretty uh, explicit about that. So regardless if it's load bearing or not, and and I understand you know the the, the potential reasoning for that. It's not load bearing, uh, but it it relates to uh, the the condition of exterior wall uh, versus um, you know load bearing or non load bearing. Excellent. All right, uh, lots of questions rolling in. Uh, here's one. Uh, what if we have an assembly with floor trusses? Uh, is that something that we would have to treat differently than, uh, you know, I know today we talked about mostly, you know, solid sawn framing, but if you're dealing with floor trusses, are, are, is there anything additional we need to be aware of? I, I I don't I'm not uh, like I said I'm I'm a code official I'm not an engineer and uh, I know some of the AWC staff are listening. Uh, we do have provisions for fire resistant uh, rated assemblies for things like engineered wood products such as I joists. Uh, but in you know in terms of the structural uh, design, uh, an I joist versus a truss. I mean they're they're still load bearing characteristics that would still need to be protected uh, adequately uh, in those particular. Um, configurations you know in the code so while we don't specifically uh, provide information um, on wood trusses uh, for example that is a fairly common uh, configuration uh, to be seen out in the field um, but I, I think you you might want to discuss um, that particular aspect of the engineering you know trusses need to be protected just like uh, I joists um, you know in in the code but the the assemblies that are depicted and tested uh, in the DCA three specifically toward the toward the back of the document with the with the you know showing the configuration the insulation the gypsum the resilient channels they they're not they were not they were not tested that way so if they're not tested this this if the components aren't tested as part of an E one nine or other test the the the, the applicability of joists joists versus i joists versus trusses are going to be different so you're going to need to seek uh, design guidance uh, from a design professional about that or a fire protection engineer all right great uh, we had another question i think most of the assemblies we talked about today were assemblies that were rated from one side only uh, can you talk about some instances where we might need an assembly rated from two sides Sure. Uh, so, you know, I yes, think that's we, typically yeah, we, we, building we separation. Like right. That. So we we talked about the the building separation distance when you when you're looking at the the structural fire resistance requirements uh, in you know in, um, in table 602, and you look at the the following uh, table uh, regarding fire separation. So you you know typically the more often than not the fire resistance criteria assumes the fire originating. Uh, inside the building. But if you have that close proximity to a property line or close proximity to another building, then you need to have symmetrical uh, fire resistant wall assemblies, right? So the, that's what we talked about the first couple slides showing the fire retardant treated wood with the gypsum on the outside. Uh, we need to provide additional fire resistance if our fire separation distances are less than 10 feet as depicted in the IBC table. So in some cases, if we're if we have close proximity, we're going to have two hour fire resistance from the exterior and two hour fire resistance always uh, required from the interior. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. All right. And we had one last question and I would be happy to answer this one because it's kind of related to the NDS and we, we both by all, know how by, much by all means, I love by all NDS. means, please do. <laughs> Please do. Thank you. So there, there was a quick uh, question on clarification of the one hour resistance rating of two by lumber in NDS chapter 16. So uh, essentially when you go into NDS chapter 16, table 16.2.1a gives you your effective char depth for uh, different uh, fire resistance ratings, one hour, one and a half hour, two hours, and it provides you with the char depth uh in that table so for a fire separation calculation you would assume a one and a half inch um, nominal char rate per hour so for every hour 
that that surface is exposed to fire, we lose an inch and a half of of material. The two by nominal two by being an inch and a half thick lines up with that one and a half inch char rate. So that's where we get that one hour resistance on a on a two by piece of lumber from. So you right, answered well, that question that... eloquently. That was nice. <laughs> I would be lying if I said I didn't have a copy of the NDS within arm's reach at all times. So uh, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and close things out. We're at about uh, 20 minutes till the top of the hour. I want to thank everybody who stuck with us today for the Q&A and, uh, and for your attendance. And I hope we will see you next month when we present our Glue Lamb panel discussion. So everyone have a great day. Thank you so much for your attendance, everybody. Take care.